Let me show you how it's done. Well, well, welcome. You are listening to The Drop, Drop, Drop. podcast on business tech and influence. I am one half of The Drop, Tam Danier, head of strategy. I lead insights and product. I focus on tech, in particular, solutions that solve real world problems. And I'm here with... My name is B. Pagels Minor. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I have been a product manager for over a decade at some of the world's most well-respected companies like Sprout Social, Apple, and Netflix. I've led teams that built important parts of the App Store, launched games at Netflix, built listening at Sprout Social. All in all, my DNA is fully being a product manager. Thank- I remember the first time someone sent me a Clubhouse link and said, you gotta check this out. And I remember logging in. I was one of those people who had a friend who was a part of the first cohort early on in the beta. And so I got access and I was in there and I was just like, wait, Am I seriously just sitting here, holding this phone, listening to some people talk at me? I don't like that. I, I was like, I don't understand how I'm supposed to participate. And so that's why it's so great we're talking about Clubhouse today and why it possibly failed um, or why it is failing or why it might turn around. Clubhouse is one of those classic examples of what the heck are you and what do you do for me type of situations. So... Clubhouse is a social media app. Its log line is a new type of social network based on voice where people around the world come together to talk, listen, and learn from each other in real time. Essentially the value proposition out to the world. A16Z is a major Clubhouse investor. Several Clubhouse executives have recently exited the company. Three more leaders announced their resignations. The platform is also struggling to hold an audience. Clubhouse was downloaded 4.2 million times between January and July of 2022. That was down from 29.4 million downloads during the same period in 2021. By comparison, TikTok was downloaded 500 million times in the first five months leading up to April 2020, bringing total downloads to 2 billion. A year ago, Clubhouse was valued at $4 billion after a round of Series C funding. It's unclear, though, how much the company is worth today. Many of the platforms that follow Clubhouse to the realm of live audio are also losing steam. Facebook shut down its short-form audio soundbites feature and its audio hub. Twitter is scaling back resources for spaces. Reddit's social audio feature launched in April 2021, and it's still in pilot mode. Discord just launched a Clubhouse clone called Stage Channels, and VC David Sachs' new social audio app Colin raised $12 million last fall. There's a lot to say about that. Why it failed or what, or will it fail? I think it, you can call this episode any one of those things. We're talking about Clubhouse because they're still on this topic of product market fit. And it's debatable whether this is an app that has it. I think it's interesting because it's trying to do a couple of things. And I don't think it's succeeding in any one of them. This is a critical point in a lot of startups trajectory where it's a decision where they will pivot or fold or continue down this path. I was speaking on a panel that was about like VCs and VC funding and what VCs are looking for out of an investment. There's three things that possibly can happen with an investment. Obviously, one is a company that is gangbusters and eventually it enters the public market. And generally when it enters the public market, you want that eight, nine, 10 figure type of exit, you know, from that public market sale. Mm -hmm. The second is this idea of it being acquired. So M&A, so it it gets acquired by another company or something like that. Or the third is that there's dissolution. We previously talked about Peloton. So Peloton, I think, you know, squarely, um, falls into that category of like a great opportunity for MA. And I think that Clubhouse is kind of similar. And so I think that that's why it's so interesting because why is it failing or is it actually failing? I think is partially the question. Typically speaking, when VCs are involved, they're looking for a, a hundred or a thousand X type investment, right? You know, they put in a novel amount of money, that company grows up and it has that, 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 that public market exit. And so with an organization like Clubhouse, at one point it was valued as a $4 billion company. So if you start to think about that, like the amount of investment that has to go into an organization to make it a $4 billion valued company, that's, you know, tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars in investment. 
And so as a result, the expectation for it is so high that by many standards, Clubhouse is a failure or it's very difficult to understand how it can pivot and and become a company that is, again, worth $4 billion. I can't find a single current valuation of the organization. It was $4 billion at some point last year, and now it's question mark. And based on the number of downloads and the, the number of active users, so it went from 18 or 19 million downloads last year to something less than 4 million or something like that. In terms of active users, I don't have any current data on that. It doesn't seem like they're actively um, sharing that information. We would presume that from the, the tens of millions of people who originally downloaded the, the app, there's a very small percentage of those users who are still using it. And so by most people's standards, Clubhouse as it stands now, unless something drastically changes, is most likely considered a failure. And I think even from an acquisition standpoint, based on the amount of investment, it could be that there'd be a very little to no return on the investment, even if it was acquired. So even from that perspective, for many VCs, it would be a failure. And so that's why I wanted to talk about Clubhouse, because the biggest issue is not necessarily, was it successful at some point? It's, was it sustainable? But when Clubhouse first came, it was probably one of the worst things to log on to, too. Like they were like, check out this thing. And it was a bunch of people who didn't look like me talking about a topic that kind of affected me in a way that was just like very strange, where I was just like, I really wish I could tag in here and tell these folks that they're going about this the wrong way. And since you have to be invited to the table, essentially, so you can listen into these conversations, but you have to be tagged in to converse with them, it wasn't a great experience. If I use something like Zoom, or Microsoft Teams, or even Slack now. You can do all these different um, mechanisms where you can have conversations with folks, but you can participate actively easily. So if I'm in a Zoom meeting, a Zoom conference, a Zoom conversation, I can just drop a comment in saying, hey, I have a comment and I would like to participate. And then all of a sudden it's an engaging conversation. And that's one of the things I always thought was missing with Clubhouse. The premise of this, this app, is essentially that there would be enough interesting conversations that people would tune in enough to call this a social media app. The Clubhouse logline, this is from their website. It's where people around the world come together to talk, listen, and learn from each other in real time. And I would say in a jobs to be done type of theory, that can happen anywhere. Mm-hmm. How do people talk, listen, and learn from each other in real time? The answer to there's so many ways for people to do that. When you're coming to this value proposition of creating a social media app out of this, social media is really hard. A lot of people say that uh, double-sided marketplaces are hard, but to be quite frank, there are many um, tech solutions out in the world that are truly double-sided in a way. And social media is one of them. When you have a social media app that's based on creating content, user-generated content, and at the same time, you have to create an experience that allows people to discover and engage with that content, you're in a double-sided marketplace in a sense, mm -hmm. right? And that's really hard to do. You've got to create an experience that allows people to create content that other people want to engage in. All you are is the middleman. But yeah. the middleman you create is extremely important to the user experience, the viability and desirability of this idea. And I just don't think that they were able to do it on two fronts. Number one, this idea of creating conversations that people want to be interested in is really hard to do. This is a really hard medium. Audio only is really hard. And that's why podcast has never really had a social aspect to it. It's, it's more of an engagement thing. When I first heard of Clubhouse, my immediate thought was, is this like return of the 90s party phone line or something? Like, is that what this is? Or is this like a live podcast? And when I think about both of those things, I think we have moved, the internet has moved us away from the party hotline right? If this is what that is, we've moved away from it. The internet has allowed us to have such more rich media engagement that this audio only, um, proposition, I don't think is desirable for today's time. We've moved past that. If it's the other one, which is a live podcast, how are you better than a podcast with a podcast? I can rewind. I can pause. I can fast forward. And I can listen to it whenever I want. 
You don't do any of those things. But to your point, you also can't engage with the podcast. This is not really a clubhouse in the sense that my expectation is that I can engage and meet people. This sounds more like church. Mm, and yeah. nobody goes to church anymore, which is probably why nobody's on clubhouse anymore. Well, you, well, you don't go to church unless the choir is amazing, um, first and foremost. But, <laughs> but secondly, the great thing about podcasts is that you know you can't engage with it, right? Like you 100% you're like, I can't engage with it. With clubhouse, it was the only place that it was like having the forbidden apple, right? It was this apple that was just like hanging in front of you that you wanted to take a bite out of. And there was no way to take a bite out of it. And it's like, well, what the heck? Like, I want to, I want to, I want my cookie. I want to be able to participate too. And so I always felt like that was a little bit wrong. And something she actually asked before, um, uh, you know, so, so Sam is almost always the person who's like, I have one major question I got to ask here. And the question you sent over this week, I, and, and I've been thinking about it ever since I saw it, which is Clubhouse the future or is it a product? And you know, the more I thought about it, it's like, it's a future. Right. And that's why the Twitters and the Facebooks and the Discords have all tried to figure out how to incorporate that functionality. And in fact, if anyone's going to do it well, it's probably going to be Discord. Right. Because I think Discord already has like these notions and these concepts. And so it's just like a natural add on to what they already do to create more interactivity and more stickiness in their communities. And it's based Clubhouse was trying to figure out how to create community. I know social media, all social media purports to try to create community. But Clubhouse in particular seems like that was one of the, the, the key notions that they had. It's like, how can you um, expedite the creation of communities to talk about certain topics, which is a little bit different than even what I think Facebook or Twitter. Twitter, in a lot of ways, it feels like you just put content out there and then people can choose to interact with you. And it doesn't necessarily matter if it's community or not. It's more like I'm stating a fact. And if you participate, that's great. And if you don't participate, that's fine, because I still got to put my fact out there. Clubhouse in particular, the key there seemed like it needed to engender the, the, the real life community that would be something that multiple people can interact on in any type of situation. Like, for instance, when I see a Clubhouse, I, so I had to download it again. And I remember just thinking after that, looking at that this weekend, I was just like, well, I could also FaceTime you or we could start a group chat. Or I could go, I mean, or face, like I started going through all the apps that can do this exact same thing. And I was just like, this is crazy. So this maybe is just the future. So Tam, what do you think? I think you're spot on. There's so many ways to accomplish this goal of letting people come together to talk, listen, and learn from each other in real time. There's so many apps that do that. There's Zoom, there's social media, there's these one-to-one -one personal things like Slack or iMessage or uh, uh, WhatsApp or Facebook. Like, this exists already. I think it was a fake community. Mm -hmm. Called it Clubhouse, but it was fake community. It had to be invited into being able to speak. How was that engagement? The reason why Twitter is more successful is it is built around engagement. That's what makes it social media. Again, I'm very much into forget what they say it is. What does it behave like? This is a podium. This is a pulpit where someone gets to feel special and sit on their pulpit on their soapbox and they talk to an audience. And as with all things, that eventually wanes in a while. You're not really giving people real access. And to be frank, I always thought that that was a very dubious claim anyway. Who would ever agree to have unfettered access to an audience of potential trolls? Reddit didn't even do that. AMA had a moderator. Oprah certainly didn't do that. She's been on TV forever. She didn't let people just come to the mic and hurl a question at the stage. Why did you think that that was going to be a kind of environment that you were going to be able to create on Clubhouse? I was interested in seeing how they would set up what I would call this game. How are you going to set this game up to be an audio-only social media app? I was very curious about that. I was also very curious about this claim that it was invite only. That was a growth tactic. And I say this with no disrespect. I just say this as I'm going to call this play out. There was no real exclusivity in this app. It was pure bullshit. I went on this app, didn't tell anybody, didn't get an invite. Within five minutes of me signing up for the app, I was let in. How? This was the gambit that Clubhouse used. It's kind of actually quite brilliant. They would force access to your contact list. 
And from that, they would scrub that list and identify who was already on the app. And then they would make the request for you. Hey, B's trying to get in. Will you let him in? This doesn't go against your credits. And so your friend would say, okay. And then you'd get in within five minutes. And so that's how they perpetuated this growth hack. And to that extent is probably their downfall. They grew too quickly. You had way too many users. You really couldn't prove value with any of them. And so in mass, they joined and in mass, they disbanded as well. But it's actually kind of a brilliant uh, growth hack. I, you know, I foresee in the future that I will be in a room and I will say something like do what Clubhouse did. Yeah, I agree with you. The way that they grew their user base, I would love to, to take that information into many of the businesses that I will work with later and implement the exact same type of ideas. To a certain extent, the exclusivity was alienating. So for instance, when I think about some of the main people that I saw, A16Z was one of their huge investors, and they also had a show on the app that people were literally signing up just to participate in this this conversation because they were like, well, I'm getting all the information about how to work with A16Z. But after like six or seven or eight of those conversations, how much more do I actually need to learn from A16Z. There was a maximum limit to how that made sense. And in that sense, they needed to do content better. Like they needed content that was going to be dynamic, that was going to grow. Most of the things I saw in Vice 4 were a lot of like wealth building or financial and things like that. I think that also just as society, we're kind of leery of this. There's a lot of the content that I saw from Clubhouse. One of the mistakes I think they made is not having enough people lined up to create different types of content before it started. In some ways, you need to seed the talent pool before you actually have the product out there in order to make it engaging enough. I think Luminary is another great example of a company that did a good job on that. So Luminary first went out to the talent and then they went to funders, for instance, and say, hey, we already have these people locked up. So if you invest in us on day one, we actually are gonna be able to, to say that we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G podcast coming up and we think we're going to monetize them in that way. And so I think that was a miss from Clubhouse. Make sure you have the content creator lined up to start off with. Another thing that I think that Clubhouse taught us is that you have to figure out how to monetize content creators ASAP. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, they got the free ride, right? Because they were completely new in their space. And so creators were able to say, well, this is providing value for me because I need to create my platform and you're now giving me a platform to do that. And by the time Clubhouse and all these other channels come up, you know, TikTok and all these other channels have come up, it's like, well, we already have platforms. We already have monetization. One reason um, Joe Rogan's contract is so large with Spotify is because YouTube was such a huge revenue generator for him. And so he was just like, I'm not incentivized to, to leave YouTube whatsoever to go to any other platform because just on the views, I am generating this amount of revenue. And I felt like that was such great context for this conversation. Why would I go to Clubhouse, a new channel that I don't really think it's necessarily going to take off? And even if it does take off, how the heck am I going to monetize that? And how is this, you know, spending time and energy making this successful is going to take me away from my other channels that are already profitable for me. So Triller is another one of those examples, kind of the same time. Clubhouse had the exact same issue too, where they couldn't figure out how to please their content creators. Like they made all these promises to their content creators, but then they didn't actually have enough funding to do this. And so then the creators rebelled against them or just like, this is the absolute worst app in the whole world. And they literally posted to their communities, do not use Triller, do not go there, do not participate in them. And that company is probably going to go. It's going to be, absolutely on very soon, um, especially with the fact that the Versus folks are already suing them for the money they didn't get paid. You have to take care of the people who are going to make your platform be great. Engagement is the whole key here. And if you don't have those people who, those creators who are going to create that engagement, you're not going to be successful or as successful in the level that you need to be. So many people took for granted that the data that was coming out from COVID was going to be sustainable. I've read so many articles about this, like, you know, some of the companies that were COVID darlings that are not doing well now. I don't understand how anyone possibly thought they were going to be sustainable at the same rate that they were during COVID. During COVID, we were all at our home looking desperately for ways to connect to a community. And that's why Clubhouse did well. Same thing for Peloton. The thing is, we out here in these streets now. If I want to go have a community-based event, I can go to my local 
co-working space that always has some kind of talk, some kind of conversation. And I can go not only have a conversation with those people, I can stop them and say, here's my card. Here's my LinkedIn. Let's actually connect. Let's actually make something happen. From a community-based perspective, there's nothing that replaces the ability to physically go talk to someone and actually make something happen with them, create something amazing with them. Clubhouse, I don't think, ever thought about that. I think it was fake social media. I don't think that it was real in the sense that it wasn't built around an engagement or following. It didn't have any of the markings that social media companies usually put. If I go on YouTube and there's a video, it tells me how long that video is. So I know what I'm committing to, you know, you go to Twitter, it's 280 characters limit. You know what you're getting into with clubhouse. It was like, what is this? Like, am I going to be here for an hour? Am I going to be here for two hours? At least what a podcast is recorded. I can see how long it is. So I can say, do I have the 45 minutes to spend to do this? So we didn't have any of that. It was really just a podium app. A, an opportunity for someone to get on a soapbox and shout out and hopefully they amplify voices and create a following in that way. But this is basically podium speaking. It's a virtual podium. The part of the quality of the content, this being an app that was based on a type of content, they didn't put any focus on the quality, which I think is the mistake that Quibi made as well. It doesn't matter the mechanism of delivery. A lot of companies make a mistake of is they prioritize technology instead of what value they actually provide. Your mechanism to deliver a message and you know, Clubhouse chose it to be audio, Quibi chose to be video, but the quality of both of those things was crap. Nobody liked it. And so it doesn't matter that you created this new way of, of creating content. It matters the quality of the content. So says the people. In the time that they were able to raise that money and get a $4 billion valuation, this is the era of VC FOMO, fear of missing out. What is the best case scenario for Clubhouse at this point? Yep. And I think it's actually to be like a Quora right? Quora is essentially a platform where any human can ask a question of the community. So the question could be, for instance, when I was first um, interviewing an Apple, I was like, what is it like to interview an Apple? was the question I asked, right? And then, you know, people, you know, chimed in is like, this is what it's like to interview an Apple. So it's a really great app that has lots of engagement. Questions I answered four or five years ago, we'll still get thumbs up where people are just like, thank you so much. And so what's really great about it is, is that it provides this notion of, I have helped someone and I also can be helped. So Quora is the best possible example of what I think Clubhouse could get if it's not acquired by someone else. And from the things I've read about, it doesn't seem like they really are looking to be acquired anytime soon. And so then my, my answer is based on if they were going to be Quora, what the heck do I think it looks like? So first and foremost, there has to be more functionality. Like the functionality is just, well, the functionality based on what I've, I've experienced. So obviously I have to say that I have not deeply engaged with it after I wasn't mostly interested. And in this past weekend is the first time I've opened it in a million years, basically. Um, and so like, I, I probably don't know about all the functionality. And so I will take that as, as a, a point of feedback um, that, that, I, I, I can't possibly know all the ins and outs. But as someone who does do a lot of public speaking, and so I know a lot about what people usually are looking for from me. So the ability to review a conversation that happened earlier. So let's say one of your favorite creators had a great conversation and the topic is product market fit. Being able to review that conversation later or there's tools that even will pull out like from, from a conversation, their AI is smart enough to pull out the clips that are most important. So maybe if I had a digest later of those clips, it would be great. I, I don't always have time to drop in on a conversation, but I have this you know, ability to do this. The second thing is the creators. So as far as I can tell, the people who I was most interested in listening to are no longer on the platform. So it's like, how the heck do you go through and, and find those people and get those people engaged again? So people like me will participate. Because again, when I dropped in, other than the folks that were having like one-off conversations, there was no one on there that I was just like, I need to hear you. Tiffany Haddish was on there. The A16Z folks were there. Those are people who the people mentioned to me. Ava DuVernay. Like when she would drop in, I would see a lot of tweets saying, hey, drop in. But, which by the way, it's funny. 
I got tweets saying to drop into Clubhouse to hear Ava DuVernay. So again, if it wasn't for Twitter, I would never have gone to Clubhouse. But they're um, supposed so, to be a social media app, huh? Exactly. So like, what is Clubhouse going to have? What creator is Clubhouse going to have that's completely unique to Clubhouse? It's like one of those huge things. And then just lastly, it's like, how the heck can I actually talk to those people? The reason I go to a talk the reason I listen to a podcast um, is to learn something. And then the talk part of it, when you're in a conference room or in a co-working space and you hear that person, you want to be able to go up to them and say, hey, I freaking love what you said. Like, that was really, really great. Thank you for saying it. And how can we work together? Because like when I, I, this is why Tam and I work together, right? It's like when we see people that we like, we want to actually connect with them and create meaningful moments that result in like actually creating great stuff. And I couldn't figure out, and I still haven't figured out how the heck to do that with Clubhouse. I think that if Clubhouse doesn't shut down in the next couple of months, it will need to pivot and compete with the Zooms of the world. It's not a social media company. And if they want to compete on the social media front, they are um, in shark infested waters. I think that Twitter, Twitter spaces is a better advantage than they do. They just don't have the, the components of social media that make this engaging. I do think there is still a need in the market for people to gather and form a community that is audio based. And there are real solutions. There are really big organizations that have members across the world that may need to get together and talk and engage on some sort of a platform that doesn't require video capabilities. And that's probably where Clubhouse has its opportunity, but that's outside of a social media platform. That's more on the sense of you're in the space of a Zoom, one-to-many communication. Maybe you're in the space of a Discord which means that would be your competition. But there's a way to get there where an organization can pay a membership a subscription to have the ability to schedule these kinds of get-togethers on this app. I think that that's where it is. I don't think that there's a play in creating these impromptu audio conversations that's going to gather or garner the kind of attention. You're basically trying to say, you know, I'm a promoter. I'm, I'm a party hoster. Come to my party tonight, right? Um, audio only, though. It's a little bit odd of a value proposition. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, so again, I think that you get rid of the social media play, focus on things that Twitter can't do well. They've had problems with their audio quality. They couldn't record, things like that. I think they need to really hone in on who their customer is, who their target customer is, how they're going to be using it, what problems they're solving. And I do think that they can create a product, a, a brand or a product around it a lot of times ideas are not products and products are not companies right now they're at they're still at an idea stage and i think they mm -hmm. can become a product they focus on who their customer is and their customer is not the social media person or this how to become a millionaire um audio chat um hosted by people who are not millionaires that's what their platform is currently attracting and i just don't see any longevity in that i think they need to focus on the kind of uh, organizations that have large communities kind of like discord that need the ability to meet with each other and engage with each other that's probably their play i think they should focus on that if they do that they would move away from being a feature and into a full product because at this level their competition against twitter or Facebook or TikTok or any other company, real social media company that wants to do this, I think can eat them for lunch. And if that's the case, maybe their best bet is getting acquired. But I don't know if acquisition is necessary. This is not hard to duplicate. If it's going to be an acquisition, it's got to be one of the really large players who are partially doing it because I think it would really please the stock market. They've had a $110 million investment. Do we think that Clubhouse is worth at least $110 million? Maybe. You know, the, could, could they break even and have like someone like a Microsoft or something feature? like that buy them? To add a feature? Not to add a feature. If you're saying... I think it just depends. I, I think it depends. I think it depends if the tech stack is different than what we think hold, it is. Hold on. Right. You think if Microsoft wanted to develop an audio feature, a component to Teams, a component that was going to cost them $110 million to bring it to market? No, not at all. But it would be partially like a big play to potentially help change the narrative of they're the, 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 the tried and true tech company. They're not the mm -hmm. sexy new thing. That's the only way I see it really happening from like a very large company is that, you know, 
it makes sense from that perspective. What's funny about this is that on Friday, I was introduced to a company that's trying to find a, it, that's trying to develop a product that's somewhere between um, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and it mentions that, you know, the better clubhouse. Again, you know, whatever you decide to do, there's someone who's observing you who's probably going to figure out how to do it better, more efficiently based on what they've learned from you. And so, and then people like me who are investors are just waiting for that person to come up because then we're going to give them our money because we think that they're the ones who are going to do it better. Um, so that's what Clubhouse is me is, is there's going to be someone else who's going to do it better. Hey, this is what I say. Hey, these ideas are free. Uh, and what the hell do I know? <laughs> yes. Thank you so much for listening to the Drops Podcast. We love having you. We love your feedback. Please do connect with us across social media. We are the Drops Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And we also have a great email, thedropspodcast at gmail.com. You can send in any questions that you have, and we definitely would love to answer them on the podcast. Feel free to ask just about anything because we have experienced a ton of different things. Again, thank you so much for listening to The Drops Podcast.